Okay, we're here with Battalion Chief Sean DeCrane, who's actually representing a number of uh, organizations, including the Cleveland Fire Department, the IEFF, and the UL Firefighter Safety um, Research Institute. So, Sean, you've been involved in a lot of this research, including the, the interior fire attack and pretty much everything that UL has been, um, been studying. You've been part of it. What do you think of uh, the research that's going on here today? I think it's critically important. Um, some people believe we may be running out of research topics, and I think we're just touching the tip of the iceberg. But I, I think it's important for us to start to look at the whole picture. And last summer, we got the ability to look and see what, through the different experiences of our, our members, what the impact on their cardiovascular system was, what we're exposing them to in, in terms of carcinogenics. And we were missing the tool on what are we doing to our recruits and what are we doing to our instructors. So this year we're looking actually at different training environments and the levels of exposures, the cardiovascular impact. And truly what I think is important out of this is that we see training provides us muscle memory, training provides efficiency, and do we have to always put our members under risk or under stress to accomplish that training? And some of those, I think some of those risks are causing us maybe not to train as often as we should, and therefore our skills degradate, but truly, first step, what is our problem? What are we exposing our members to and what's the impact on them? Two, uh, what are the different exposures? And three, uh, what are different strategies that we can provide the best level of training to our members? So when we look at this, it, there is a chance that we're going to find out information that we don't want. But sure. the reality is, is this is ultimately about firefighter safety. We're mm -hmm. looking out for our members and making sure that if we are exposing them inappropriately, we make some changes. Is there anything over, the, you, been, you were here yesterday and seen some of that uh, research being conducted. Is there anything that you've seen that kind of struck you as odd or kind of a spike? Uh, as far as the thought process? Well, I think some of the challenges that we have or some of the questions, the debates, are specifically are what are we using in our burning? 1403 requires us to use clean wood products, not just combust a combustibles, but clean wood products. What is a clean wood product? So we're losing within the timber industry that clean wood. Sure. Well, the products that we're now experiencing are engineered products. Well, what does that contribute to our training? Because some people believe that believes it adds more realism to our training. Uh, but what's the trade-off? Again, that risk-benefit. Are we realizing a greater uh, real, uh, reality in that training? And does it provide value? Or are we just exposing our members to additional hazards? So I think that's one thing we're going to be learning here. But also, uh, can we get some training? How is the training if we can create an atmosphere that challenges them, but doesn't always put them at such a risk. Yeah, a lot of this is, we're just looking at what burns great. Yeah. I mean, years ago, it used to be tires. You needed to create thick <laughs> smoke, you burn tires. And we've evolved from that. So the, yeah. the fear of some of this 1403 stuff being overarching and, and putting live fire uh, almost to an impossible level, I don't think that's going to occur. We're going to find right. the right product, but we do have to identify whether we're exposing people inappropriately. Let's walk through kind of how this research comes about. I know when we sit on that panel, it's, it's all about the questions that firefighters are asking. Right. And we looked at a helmet earlier that had a lot of technology built into that, and that was based on firefighters asking the question, what if or but, how does that go as far as the UL advisory board? Well, as you know, Tim, we get together, we start talking a little bit holistically of some of the challenges in the fire service. And we're really blessed. We have 20 members, from around the world, really, that represent fire departments from FDNY to the smallest departments in Cobb County or Whitby Island, but also Sweden, Germany, Japan. And uh, our experiences, I think, are, are universal in nature. So we're learning from one, one another, but we're also identifying those gaps. And then once we identify a gap, now we sit around and we get technical panel members that really can start to look at the minutia of, of those gaps. What do, we, what do we want to find out? What's our problem? And I think that's why we're seeing different environments here because we have different ways of approaching our, our problems or trying to resolve our training solutions or training our members. So really what's the best way to do it? Is it a combination? Because I don't think, I think live fire training has value. Do we have to do it as often to train our members? Maybe not, but to understand that, we're, we're starting to understand what the risk. And I'm glad you brought up the helmet because I think one of the things our members we don't learn enough about is how our PPE actually works and the limitations of our PPE. 
our PPE is actually an absorbent. It's a sponge and it's, it's absorbing that energy. And, and with holding the, it. And holding it. Yeah. With that modern fire environment, with the polyurethane foam furniture, we're getting hit with more energy in a shorter period of time, which is saturating our PPE. And with the helmet they've, they've designed here, which is one of a kind, we're starting to realize that real time heat flux, that energy that, that the firefighter is being exposed to. And that's just a, a clean wood product. Sure, so sure. Uh, I think the other components of the research that are looking at the modern fire environment, now we can sit there and, and measure the heat flux, now measure what the firefighter is being exposed to. And maybe we're, we're gonna see that extrapolation so we can see a real world. Looking at your other hat, obviously the IEFF is very concerned about its members and what we're being exposed to. Is there anything else that the IEFF is looking at uh, of points of concern with this type of research and maybe some of the findings? Well, last year, Pat Morrison, our assistant to the general president for health, safety, and medicine was here. And Pat sat on the technical panel and we discussed a lot of the issues of why we're here. Uh, cardiovascular events, Obviously, everyone knows 49% of line of duty deaths are cardiovascular events. So we sometimes get pointed that that's the number one killer of firefighters. And really, the number one killer of firefighters, active and retired, is cancer. Uh, we put 352 of our brothers and sisters on our memorial wall last year, and 60% of them are cancer-related occupational diseases. So uh, we're looking at training here. So are we, what are we introducing our cadets to? And can we do it better from day one so we're limiting their exposures throughout their career? We can't eliminate it, but can we reduce it? And I guess that's what we're trying to understand here. And then the other challenge is to get this information out to our membership. As we've talked about before, research is great, information is great, right. but you got to do something with it. Absolutely. Well, Sean, I appreciate your Thank time. Thank you, Tim. I appreciate and, you being here. And folks, I, I think it's important that we, we take what's being shared here as not only are we, we capturing a lot of information, but it's directly relevant to the most critical issues, and that is obviously firefighter safety. So not only looking at the cardiovascular side and those chemicals that are affecting our cardiovascular system, but also the carcinogen side as well.